Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to have you with us on this bright, cheery February morning, 8 a.m. Look, the good news is the days are getting a little bit longer. It's no longer pitch dark when we all wake up. In fact, we've got the beginnings, the beginnings of a little bit of sunshine on the horizon. That's a kind of metaphor for our day, I think. Today, the reason I'm so cheerful is finally we are going to talk about patience. We're going to talk about patient communications and means by which we can improve it. I have a stellar panel of expert contributors with me. We have the fabulous Richard Wyatt Haynes, who's director at HCI, Claire Mould, Dr. Claire Mould, director of strategy at BCE, and perhaps Claire in a moment you can tell us what BCE is, and Owen Richards, who's chief executive at Health Watch South End. Fantastic to have you all with us. We are waiting for a couple of other panelists who may or may not make it. We'll see. Don't let that stop us. I'm just going to give Richard, Claire and Owen a quick chance to explain a little bit about their organisations. We'll start with Richard, please. Good morning. Thank you, John. Uh, pleasure to be here and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the director of HCI and we use digital information to help patients understand the multiple conditions that they may have, how to manage them, trying to reduce anxiety at home, um, helping them to engage with the health system so they can get the most out of it. And we do that using uh, principally uh, video as a tool. We were provider to NHSX of the National Library during the COVID lockdown of around 600 videos there and a tool, an app called a Connect Plus, um, which is a, a, a multi-morbidity app to help patients, as I said above. Thank, Thank you, John. Richard. Look forward Thank to it. Thank you. Claire. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, as John said, I'm Director of Strategy at BCE. BCE is Bespoke Consultancy and Education, and we provide learning and development for people who work across the health and social care sector. That's right from supporting people that traditionally known as unpaid carers, otherwise known as family members, right the way through up to commissioners, and you know broader senior managers so right the way sort of surprise you know supporting both accredited and bespoke training opportunities for them to help people basically support the individuals that they're working with in the most effective ways and just a tiny little bit of background because that will contextualize probably some of the responses i'll be making as a panel member is prior to coming here i've worked in the charity sector in health and social care for nearly 20 years being ceo of a charity that provide housing for 16 to 18 year olds um, homeless young people and then latterly a charity that provided residential care and care in the community for adults with complex mental health needs and learning disabilities so done a lot of support with uh, accessing uh, appointments from many different uh, directions uh, with them so an absolute pleasure to be asked to join today. Thank you Claire and absolutely not least, but certainly last, Owen, lovely to have you with us. Just tell us a little bit about Healthwatch Southend and your role. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, so Owen Richards, I'm Chief Exec at Healthwatch Southend, uh, and I didn't put it on the intro, but I, I also chair the Royal College of General Practitioners Patient and Carer Group. So I, I, I input the patient view, hopefully, into the, the college's policy making. So Healthwatch Southend is one of uh, 150 odd health watches around England. Uh, where there is the independent voice of the patient and the carer, uh, both in health and social care services, uh, where they're to listen to local people, capture their lived experience and feed into commissioning policies. Uh, and we also hold the NHS and our local council to account in terms of delivering on standards, the NHS constitution, et cetera. Uh, so we're very much the voice of people independent of both the NHS and local authority. Uh, but they're also in a partnership role as well. So we work closely with them to, again, to give that patient view and, and input. Thank you, Owen. Well, as you can see, everybody, this is a diverse, but highly expert and knowledgeable and experienced panel. And the interesting thing is, look, for all of us, whenever you go to the, a pub or meet people, there's always somebody who's got some kind of a story to tell once you get on to how's your health and that kind of stuff. Somebody always has a story to tell about personal experience, family experience, friend experience, and it invariably ends up about something to do with a problem with patient communication. 
So this is a universal issue that we don't perhaps talk about enough from a management and leadership perspective within health and social care. So I'm thrilled that we've got the opportunity today. I'm going to talk to the panel for about half an hour and then we're going to open it up for some Q&A. But what I'd like to start off with is, is the key question, I think. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to give some thought to where are the principal fault lines in patient communications currently? Because I think it's important we try to contextualize the problem, if possible. And the best way to do that is to address, so where are the fault lines? Where are the typical problem areas that for some reason we habitually struggle to address properly? And perhaps if we start with, um, we'll start with Claire, would you mind Claire going first on this? No, very, very happy to go first. Um, I think for me, in my experience, one of the core fault lines is uh, communication is only as good as its capacity to reach the people that it needs to. And I think that there are a raft of people, particularly when we're looking at vulnerable individuals that are lost in community. And so they're not being picked up. They're not being so increasingly what's happening is vulnerable individuals that are living in the community. There's been a ground shift from supported residential care to people living independently in the community. But as that has happened, a lot of their support hours have left, have, have been lost. And there's a danger that those individuals aren't aware. So they're missing out on things like annual health checks. They're missing out. I mean, and we've only got to see through the recent um, rollout of the vaccinations, vulnerable individuals in the community were at the very end of the line before anybody picked up and said, actually, these are a group that need to be moved up the line with regard to having some vaccinations. So I'm not saying that the intention isn't there, but if it's not reaching the right people and to sort of, I don't want to start with a very sombre note, but why not? We know that there's evidence to say that individuals with um, learning disabilities and complex mental health needs die quite significantly younger than other individuals. Whereas if you look at the reasons that they die, they're not related to their disabilities. They're often related to health issues that if they had been picked up sooner would have been preventable or at least the risk mitigated extending their life um, expectancy. So for me, just for as a start of the 10, I'd say that one of the fault lines is we've got to make sure that no matter how good our communication is, we're confident that it's reaching the very, you know, uh, the, the very individuals, the, the vulnerable individuals that it really needs to. Thank you, Claire. Great start. I like that one. Um, and it's not something I'd have immediately thought of, actually. Um, I don't know how the rest of the audience will feel, but I think that's a really uh, intelligent and perceptive start there. Let me come to Richard next. Richard, your thoughts on this one. Okay. Yep. I, I wish we'd had warning for this question, but anyway, I'll do my best. Uh, John, I, I think uh, in my simple way of looking at it is a, is a three C's. I think there's a lack of coherence, lack of capability, lack of commitment. Okay. And I'll try and nail each one in turn. So, I see, and I, I come from more from the acute sector as much as anything, but I'm going to touch into the other sectors as well. I see a lack of coherence. In other words, I don't see consistent blocks of information drawn together in a meaningful way that can be used at the patient interface, wherever that may take place, face-to-face, -face, online, through any vehicle. I, there are bits, people walk out with bits of paper that may or may not be connected in any way at all. Nobody's really thought through, well, how does that connect with that bit? And where do I get, how does that connect with the website that might also be providing information that hasn't been drawn together? And that's not helped by a fragmented system where different people are doing slightly different things. But in the community, you would hope there would be some coherence and some consistency to the messaging. Uh, Capability-wise, I'm in a digital world and uh, I don't see the people representing health. Um, so in other words, healthcare professionals, care assistants, whoever, clinicians, whatever you want to call them, having the capability to, and the confidence maybe, to explain 
uh, and provide information in a really meaningful way and support documents that can go around that or information tools that go around that. And that's both the paper bits. How do I introduce it in a in a meeting? How do I use it effectively? But equally, the confidence and capability to use digital in today's world effectively in that interface. And for us, the biggest barrier is actually getting to good information sharing is that capability to say, look, here is an app. It will do this for you. This is how you can use it in your care. And lastly, I think linked to that is the commitment to do that. And that's a leadership task where leadership across the system says how important good communication is and its importance in enabling all their staff, wherever they are, whoever they are, to communicate effectively and confidently with the people that need their support. And that absence is a, a sad, sad hole for me because it's desperately needed. And we could save so much time, reduce so much anxiety for people if that was given some focus, because the other two would fall out of it. All right. Thank you, Richard. The three C's. I'm always a fan of, you know, threes and fives and ten point things. I, I do my best for you, John. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can see an editorial. I can feel an editorial coming out there. Owen, give us your perce uh, perception here from Healthwatch's perspective. Follow that. I mean, I, I think I'd agree with, with what Claire and Richard have said. I think there's... Um, there is still this thing that there's a power imbalance. So because knowledge is power, as we all know, there is something about where clinicians come into all of this uh, and the ability to actually think about the recipient more, which I suppose plays to some of, of Richard's points. Um, I mean, recently I've been doing some work as a complaints advocate and some of the, the complaint responses I see are fine if you're a consultant. Uh, and I've got a, I've worked in the NHS for about 30 odd years. So, I mean, I've got a fairly good medical vocabulary uh, but actually then sitting down with the complainant, with the consultant, you know, I was really struck by that power imbalance there uh, and the real need to try and address that complainant's issues, which, you know, didn't feel that successful in that, that meeting because, again, the language was very, was very defensive, was very medicalised rather than actually trying to get the root of what this individual was, was trying to get to. I think my second thing, and, and again, it does play on Richard's points to, to a degree, is that we seem to quite often go headlong into digital first. So I worked with my, my local system and, and there was a paper recently and it talked about engagement and the first bullet point was digital first. Uh, and whilst I'm, I'm saying it does have a place, actually it doesn't work for everyone. And there are, there are so many nuances within this. I mean, if you think about someone who's, who's on a very low income, yes, they've got a mobile phone. But actually, if their credit runs out on day 27 of the month or something, and they can't then top that up till the first of the month, there's a hole there. We see people who um, are quite articulate in English, but actually they can't read English. So it's great sending stuff out. It's great using text messaging, all those sorts of things. But actually, the recipient can't always read those messages in English. So I think there are so many nuances around this. So, you know, there's such a need to, to think about market segmentation, to, to borrow that phrase, uh, and to, just to remember that one size does not fit all. So I'm a great fan of digital where it works. And it's great because it also frees up capacity uh, within the system. So thinking about primary care at the moment, during lockdown, or most of the practices or all the practices turned off their online booking systems. Um, and now we have that thing that they're slowly turning the back on. They're not publicizing the fact that you can go back to online booking. And then we get so many complaints coming to Healthwatch about how difficult it is to get a, uh, a, an appointment with a GP and how hard it is to get through on the telephone. So digital is part of the solution to that because it does free up some of the capacity. I think the other thing for me, uh, and you may have seen some press coverage yesterday about this, is accessible information standards. Uh, and Healthwatch England have just released some, some work about how good or not good the NHS is about complying with the accessible information standards. So again, it plays some of Claire's points about people who've got particular communication needs. How good is the NHS in terms of actually identifying those from the outset, recording them and meeting those needs? So I think for me, it is very much about taking from that patient perspective, the recipient of any communication. And I don't know that the NHS always gets that right. Perfect. Well, look, 
I've got to say three stellar answers there. Um, and it's kind of teed it up really rather nicely. I've, I've got, I've made six notes there in terms of specific things that you've said around the fault lines. And so I think we'll probably aim, aim to address some of those as we go along. But my, my next question is, is a bit of a cruncher really, because if we're looking to improve matters and we, we understand where some of the fault lines are, and by the way, we, I, I am at pains to make sure that we include social care in this as well and the fault lines that exist between health and social care as much as anything else. But what I wanna know is, how do we measure success in respect of a communication strategy across the health and social care sector? Because you hear lots of initiatives. I think Richard makes a really strong point around coherence because we kind of break things up into fragmented little bits of, 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 uh, of information and communication and terminology. So there's something around coherence, but how do we measure success or otherwise of an overall national communications uh, or a regional communications or a local project communications initiative? How do we do it? In other words, how do we know that we're doing it right? Um, I could, should we go in reverse order just to kind of tickle things up here and keep the panel on their toes? By the way, that wasn't a, a question that I was necessarily expecting response from the audience for. <laughs> go on, Owen, I've, I've, I've flabber blab, blabbered enough to give you a little bit of time to think of your answer. How do we measure success? Yes, so, so I think for me, it's about, again, understanding our communities. I think the success measure is about how we engage with those who are lost in the system, um, the ones who don't normally access services because we make them too difficult to access. So I think if I was doing it here in my, my patch, I know that the after English, the, the most common language spoken is Polish uh, in the South End. So I think that's my litmus test. I would want to go out and engage through networks with the Polish community and talk to them about it. Because if we're not reaching people like that, then we're not <laughs> succeeding. And, and that very much is the ethos of, of a health watch, a local health watch, is to go out and talk to local people and find out how successful some of these initiatives All right, so, are. So let me, let me cling on to that, because I love, I love the direction of travel here. Health watch's purpose is to go out and engage and talk with local people to find out what's going on. Owen, oh, help us understand, how do you do that? Do you do surveys or is this, you know, uh, uh, wearing out leather on the pavement? You know, how, how do you go about engaging with your community? So, so each local health watch will be out there, as you say, wearing out the leather. Um, and, and we use mixed methodologies. So we will use digital approaches where that works. But actually, we go to where people are. So if there's a, you know, a Polish pensioners luncheon club, We'll go there and we'll talk to them um, because we we don't do quality we don't do quantitative research necessarily we do qualitative research it's about lived experience so for us it's about actually going out and finding where where do members of that community meet who are their leaders um, and we work very closely coming back to your earlier thing about not forgetting social care we work very very closely with our borough council. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've reflected about engagement over, you know, decades in the NHS is that local government does it far better than we do in the NHS. So for me, it's about linking in with um, actually the, my two links in the council are Polish. So it's about talking to them and saying, so where do I find these people? Yeah. Help me to go and have those conversations with them. Let me talk to two or three people because the power <laughs> of storytelling is just so important in the work that we do. And then we can take those examples back to commissioners and providers within the NHS and, and social care. So from a success perspective, this is qualitative, it's lived experience, it's yeah. narratives, it's people telling their stories. Yes. And you're, you're trying to sort of bring that together into some kind of an assessment of are we are we doing what we should be doing as well as we should be doing it? Is that yeah, about right? Yeah, but because as, as I say, for me, the real litmus test is about how does this feel when you receive that text, you receive that letter, uh, you receive that information booklet? Is it is it helping? All right. um, and I think it, it's about, you know, also looking for some of those resources. So 
as people may know, we're promoting the GP patient survey at the moment, and there are flyers in various different languages. So we've sent out the Polish one to encourage people from that community, if they get the questionnaire, to complete it and, and feed back. And some of that will impact on communication because there are questions in there that, that we can work on. But it's also about promoting some of these initiatives as well and saying, you know, you ought to be able to get communications in this way if you've got some sensory disabilities you can make that aware you have a legal right to have information provided in the right way to you Is yeah, that yeah. So, sorry, I, just just to be clear I, I i didn't understand the breadth of what we would like to do this is a, i'm specifically talking about success yes measurement. yeah we'll, we'll move on to the so what should we do in a minute i promise you okay richard your thoughts on this how do we measure success there's owen there he's got his qualitative processes which i rather like is there anything quantitative we could do as well gosh that's really tricky i i was going to come in from where i, I knew where Owen would come from and i support exactly what he said i think that whole issue of you can only really measure it at the the user's end um that that's that's the point at which it's either having success or not what is the reputation of the health system in the pub that you mentioned at the top of this call um, what is the patient feedback? Are we reaching those people who are naturally harder to reach than others? How are we reaching them? But how, how do we know that we are? I, I think the work that Owen and his colleagues do countrywide are our best. So, so it's, the vol it's the volume of stuff and it's the fact that someone like Healthwatch is able to produce a coherent, thoughtful, empathetic report or guide or something like that that says actually you know we've got our finger on the pulse here this this yeah you know and at least i suspect owen and his colleagues are honest enough to say one and here's some areas that we still haven't reached you know particularly yeah. well i i think what would be interesting in a, in a way given what we've talked about is the, the failure of communication leads to anxiety for people um and i've never seen anything that uh, i think there is research out there but you know is good communication reducing people's anxiety and people within the service, you know, and you could argue that that would be a really big measure for me. Uh, given I started organisationally, John, I go for the same thing, and I think I'd look at uh, look at it from the the communicators' side as well, in terms of how confident and capable they feel about communicating the messages that they need to get over. How effective are they? So I think there's an element there's an element there. Um, that would warrant measuring as well. Because actually, if you've got a healthcare professional, if you've got a doctor who's confident and capable and feels better as a communicator, we've got a greater chance of getting an effective message across. Um, so there is an internal measurement side as well, I think, um, because that's, that's where it comes from. And the best communication companies in the world do, do look at, the capability of their teams and how they how effective they are at communicating so um if we believe it's important we should be measuring well, wait, wait, wait 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 there we're going to come on to that in a moment or two because I, I think that's a huge huge question to ask ourselves but claire perhaps your response to this this one Okay, well, um, I mean, it won't surprise you that I completely concur with what Owen and uh, and Richard and Richard said about you know the most important thing is giving voice, but just to move the conversation on and add a add a different dimension, um, extending from Richard's point about the individuals having confidence. I think that means, and it links onto an earlier point that he said about you know with you know, health and social care workers, I think we've got to be aware that people need to be appropriately trained to ask the right questions, because for me, we've got to define, it's all very well sort of saying about, you know, how do we measure success? The starting point is, what are we calling success? You know, what does success look like? And the individuals that are gathering that information, be it qualitative or quantitative, that they have to say, well, actually, but what does success look like and from a sort of brutally quantitative perspective at the very sort of end rate it's looking at mortality rates and then coming down we're looking at how many people are taking up annual health checks if they have they gone up you know we're looking at hospital admissions have they gone down are we able to deal with things or if needed have they gone up depending you know are people noticing you know things like sort of 
cancer concerns i know that i've been, i've done a lot of work in the community with spotting sort of early signs of cancer that you know with vulnerable individuals so they're spotted earlier so we can prevent things so there are some sharp um quantitative measures that we can use but all of those completely as richard and owen said start with those conversations but for me it is being really really clear so what why are we asking this because otherwise an awful lot of time and goodwill is spent going out into the communities developing those relationships getting the conversation doing but how do we push beyond that to say right now we've developed this mutual respect and recognition that people are hooking in and they're going to appointments so what 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 difference is that making are people being able are we noticing that there are more strategies that individuals don't need that external um, scaffolding so when good colleagues from health watch aren't around that they've learned from that that they are able to access those things on their own so there are the kind of monitors that i'd be really interested in seeing once the scaffolding is removed are those individuals able to access it and then so what happens is it's sort of a multifarious approach that you know the quality of them feeds into the quantitative because they both have to sit naturally together and we can see that there are some sharp you know sharp points that we can uptake but we've got to continually when people are going out they've got to understand what is the point of us doing this beyond the i've just got to get that person to this appointment or i've got to make these people aware that these services actually are we actually saying that we're trying to <clears throat> reduce people dying early being ill preventative because then all of those things once we answer those questions they'll provide little offshoots of other um monitoring points that we can do does that make does that make sense i just wanted to bring a slightly different spin it does, of it, 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 it does completely i think the, the question i'd ask is so how good are we at actually receiving patient and service receiver feedback are we set up to easily receive volunteered feedback from people so that people can tell their stories so that you know we, we are in a position so that we can monitor some of the uh, uh quantitative measures that you've already described claire or is it just is it is, is it a little bit bitty around the country and inconsistent and you know what we're not really set up to do this well and there's this awful kind of patient satisfaction survey malarkey you think I don't want to be satisfied as a patient? I mean, if I go to my take my, you know, significant other out to a restaurant or the pub or the theatre, I don't want to be satisfied with the experience. If I'm only satisfied, I'm never going back. I want to be delighted. I want this to be a fantastic, life-affirming experience. So we've got to you, get. And to you the, also need to want to know that the information you fed back has made a difference. Absolutely so. And I think, and I mean, I know I used to work years ago as a senior research fellow, and a lot of that involved working, um, doing research with the government. And it used to really infuriate me when they'd come out and make the government statements, sort of saying, "Oh, we've consulted with researchers." And I used to be shouting at the, you know, at the. Not television with me. Saying, yes, you did, but you didn't listen to us, though. You didn't do anything <laughs> about it. You consulted with us, and I think. And that's the bit that people you know if we're going to monitor it we don't want to monitor that we've done this many service surveys we've spoken to people it's but what did you do with the data that you've gathered all right so i'm going to try to move this along because I, I want each of you at the end to well let, let's do this now let's let's try this now so in the interest of quantifying the current experiences of patients and service receivers and i use the expression service receivers to reflect the needs of people uh in in the social care uh, environment scale of one to five nice and simple everybody loves a one to five scale scale of a one to five how seriously does health and social care take the issue of patient communications right now uh, and then when you've given your answer i'm then going to move on to so what do we need to do to make change what do we need to do to get it to five out of five uh, and let's let's just mix this up, Richard. You okay. know you're um, going to be. I thought this, I thought you were going to say how good are we, but how sliding seriously scale, do we take sliding it? scale. How seriously do we take it? Two. Is it two? How seriously do we take it? All right. Thank you, Claire. I agree. I had two written down as well. Yeah. This is good. 
Owen. Guess what? Two. <laughs> oh! Two out of five, forty percent. I mean, it's 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 B minus. In fact, no, it's C minus territory. That's not a great start. Mm. Paula says, "Wow, a bit insulting, really." Um, all right. So, what do we need to do if we? I mean, isn't it lovely to have just, consensus? What do we need to do if if we just to respond to Paula? Sorry, just quickly, John. Yeah, go ahead. If if you'd asked how how good are we? I might. I would have gone a five or a, uh, sorry, five or six. So um, three ish. I would have gone say. to a six, Richard. Yeah. So I couldn't. Out of ten, I was. I was thinking as you were asking the question, but that's reliant, to my mind, on the individuals. So systemically, mm. uh, I don't think I, I would stick to a two in terms of how seriously do we take it. How do we perform? I was let's say a three or a four not even that much, around about a three, because individuals go out of their way day in, day out to try and communicate to people. Um, and I, I, I'm just picking up on what Paula said there. Um, I, I think we have to, we have to recognise the, the amazing endeavours that people do to try and communicate. No, no, let, 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 and this, this isn't a reflection on, on the efforts that people make. This is a reflection on how, you know, we, if, if we look at clinical practice, for example, I would suggest that the nation takes that as a five out of five, that it, it regards it that importantly. But the business of communicating with patients and service receivers simply doesn't have the same kind of priority and focus as clinical process, for example. It just doesn't. Uh, so anyway, what do we do to resolve that? Uh, and I'm going to stick with it because I'm not, not reading Richard off that easily. We've got only <laughs> about three or four minutes to go before I want to open okay. this Q&A. So briefly, Richard, what do we need to do to get it from a two out of five to a five out of five? Uh, number one, and this is really on the hoof. Uh, number one is uh, the, the whole leadership piece, taking responsibility for it, actually recognising that effective communication uh, benefits Patients both, I'm going to come back to anxiety, but critically enables patients to self-manage more independently, more effectively, thereby reducing demand on the system. Yeah, but, but your key point is that starts from the top. That starts Absolutely. from the leadership. We have, to, we have to make clear the importance of communication that it's central to what we're about. Right. And I mean in that I'm sense, gonna, I'm gonna I'll give you an example. We're going to run out of time otherwise. Okay, yeah. PR departments are focused on doing press releases, right? That is not communication. Flip them on their head and their role and really build organisational capability to communicate to the public, not to the press or your local MP. All right. I like that. I like that. Um, Owen, I'm going to give you your opportunity now. So... One of the things that, that we promote uh, in HealthWatch is co-design. So I think if we get the leadership right, as Richard said, I think we ought to be co-designing our communication systems with the people who receive services, be it in health or, or social care. So I think there's a really strong argument for coming back to the people and talking to them about, did you understand what you were given? How could we improve it? That There was a great thing that came around on Twitter last night, actually really good timing. Uh, going back to a BMJ article back in, I think it was 2017, where they got nine-year-olds to design patient communications on the basis that the average reading age in this country is about nine. Um, so, so there is something about, again, it's that, do you want to call it ethnography? Do you want to call it market segmentation? I think it's very much about thinking about who we are trying to communicate with. Uh, and again, to follow on from Richard's point about PR departments, it's that they write press releases knowing how it's going to be received and used. Why don't we use all their skills and competencies then to get it really into that field of, of co-designing with others? Uh, and my last point, and it's a plug for the Personalised Care Institute, is to get more and more people through the PCI training, because so much of that is about communication. And I think if you can really strengthen that, and you think about things like shared decision making, that will make such a difference in the way we communicate on a patient level, but then it can also be scaled up into how we think about larger communities. Perfect. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, I do love the co-design 
I think that that's a, that's a little gem to come out of this session. Claire, your your response here. Well, well I agree, and I was going to say, actually, you know, just putting in something, you know, I think that looking at the success or otherwise of co-designing, co-producing, because I think we've got a long way to go to make that effective. By, so can I do a plea to say, could we do a, a power hour and potentially unpicking that another time? Because I think that we could have some very interesting conversations. But for the sake of this and to, again, not just to repeat um, what Richard and Owen have said, uh, with regard to how we can move forward, I think, We've got to realise that with regard to, again, as Rich said, you know, with prioritising, time spent at good communication saves time down the road, whereas where we're putting our endeavours at the moment, and we certainly didn't mean to insult or offend anybody, because how much can you do if you're given a certain amount of time to speak to somebody? That isn't what effective communication looks like. We've got to prioritise to make sure what goes ahead of that. And also... We've got to realise that what we are saying is not always what people are hearing. So if somebody goes to an appointment, you could say that, well, actually, I'm communicating in the most empathetic way possible. And my communication is really, really high. I should be getting a five out of five because I really value that. Or I've sent letters out. But what we've got to do to move this on is to explore to say actually is that what genuinely because I spend a lot of time with individuals who have not speak then they come out and they completely confused what that communication was they didn't quite understand it or they receive a letter or increasingly so and again this is nobody's fault people are under immense strain people are doing telephone consultations and some people aren't auditory learners they really really struggle with doing telephone consultations and the terminology and this will be my final point because I'm very conscious of this a very very simple quick win is please can we look at the terminology that we use we forget how alienating some of these things are if you sort of you're having a conversation you know it takes an awful lot of guts for any of us when you're in that to say oh and do you know what that means to turn around and say no actually I haven't got a clue what you're talking about you just sort of nod and then you go away and then it's followed up with a letter that sends you to a different department that's got an intimidating name that you can't even pronounce all of this is pushing the patient further and further away from nurturing that relationship which is absolutely key to effective communication yeah, but of course the organization will tick the box to say they've provided them with the appropriate communication absolutely we've offered this we've offered that we've sent out this all right thank you claire um well look I, I've, I've got look at this look at this i've got pages of notes here there's some really good stuff that's gone on here but i i said we'd talk for about half an hour and then open this up to a q a we've got a number of people who've got up early this morning. Would anybody like to ask the panel a question from their own perspective uh, in respect of patient and service receiver communication? Do feel free, open up. And uh, uh, if you want to put your hand up, that was that's probably the easiest way of doing it. And then we'll go from there. By the way, this is designed as an interactive session. If anybody was still wondering, you know, I'm now giving you the permission to be interactive. Leanne, Lee, we've got Leanne Bood, and then I'm going to come to Fran Husson. Leanne, your question, please. Um, it's not so much a question, more of um, an observation and picking up on some of the points of the panel. Um, and it was quite interesting around the nurturing nature of communication that we're having with patients. And I think that's obviously where digital communication is missing the trick. There's nothing better than person-to-person -person communication. Um, <laughs> rather than, you know, relying on fiery messages out to people, bamboozling them with information. Some people actually just need that, you know, that face-to-face -face and that time with an actual real person. Um, and I think that goes a long way with nurturing people and supporting them on their patient journey. Thank you, Leanne. Got a point very well made. I'm going to come to Fran and then... We're going to come to Paula, who's feeling hopeless this morning. She can't find her raise hand thing. So she's just begged all of us if she can actually ask a question at some stage. We'll come to her. Fran, first of all. Fran Husson. Thank you. Thanks, John. Well, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. I couldn't agree more. I mean, all the, 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 the important points for patients have been mentioned this morning. And thanks, Owen, for mentioning the AIs, the accessible uh, information standards and the review was published recently. I mean, I've got basically two points to make. One is, is a point, but there's also a question. How does the panel view 
the fact that the GP record, which is still the kind of basic information document for most of us, does not contain all the important information such as this patient cannot use the telephone, cannot see, uh, has problems reading, whatever it is, or would prefer communications in Polish, whatever it is. I mean, to me, this is the basis because we have seen when the pandemic started, real issues when people who should have been told to start shielding, elderly people who have impairments and disabilities being left out because they're the ones who are left out all the time. No one knows about them. No one really cares about them. And this is, this is happening a lot. I do work closely in my area with Health Watch and also other um, charities like the Advocacy Project. And there are some really terrible, distressing situation. But every time, you know, I keep thinking, why is it that no one at the GP surgery, and I don't just mean the GPs, we know the GPs are so overworked. I don't see how, really, uh, what they can do in eight minutes of, of time with the patient. But the GP practice um, at other times has administrative and clerical staff we should be able to manage this issue of communication, making sure that for each patient, they have the right information. And for instance, if a patient- yeah, Just very quickly, please, yeah, sure. um, because Sorry. otherwise we're gonna run out of time for others. Um, well, basically the, the issue is, I mean, the starting point would be to correct the GP record to make sure we know exactly who the patient uh, issues okay. are. Okay. As so, Second point, very, okay. very quickly, is that if we want to improve communications, first of all, we have to listen to the patient. I don't, don't think we've, we've achieved that yet, and I would stop here. Thank you, Joe. Perfect. Thank you very much, Fran. I don't know, we've got Paula here who's finally managed to figure out how to raise her hand. I'm very grateful for that. Oh, Paula, sorry, every... Paula, is, it, is it right that GP patient records don't contain key communication details? Is that right? Um, if you're saying, is it, is, it, is it correct that doesn't happen? It should be happening. We should all be asking um, new patients. Uh, there is an issue with current patients, granted. New patients, what's your preferred method of communication? That is in the AI, uh, that, that should be standard. Um, my question, and, and I agree with what Fran's saying, but my query on this is, and, and it was tongue in cheek, my comment, um, in so much as I think, and I'm speaking from, as a practice manager, as a relatively small practice, that uh, we, we value it very highly. Do we do it very well? No, I don't think we do. And I think we've got frontline staff, they're relatively low paid, they pay less than £10 an hour, they are highly, highly trained to a point. It, it's a massive role. It's a really difficult role. Um, and there is, I would say, a lack of training because they could spend half the time training because there are so many areas. We get one protected session a month, so they get 12 four-hour sessions a year. And we have about 40 different modules and areas of training to cover. And AI has been um, at the top of my list for a very long time because I'm, I'm very keen on this, making sure that we do communicate with patients as individuals. But the, there's an issue of capacity. And um, I, I think, um, sorry, I can't remember your name. You're talking about um, highly educated people should be able to be speaking to people appropriately. The staff that we have on the front line, I'm not saying they're not educated, that they're not bright or anything, but they're not a degree level communicator. And we are very limited with how we can train people to communicate in all these many, many different ways from Makaton to communicating with people um, with high functioning autism or um, Down syndrome, et cetera, myriad, as we all know. That's not right. That's why we don't do it well. That's so, why so, I so, give us so, one so, or two. Sorry, sorry to cut across yeah. just short yes, of time here. Sure. So what yep. do we do about that? It's, we, we all know the problems. They, they, are, they yes. are well documented. You know, hmm. Paula, you are by no means the only person that would be able to talk to a panel like this about them. What should we do about it? I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I, it's capacity. It's... Uh, 
his capacity, his finances. Is, it, is it back to Richard's three C's? Coherence, capability and commitment. I suspect it is. I, I would say that we have all, all of those. Coherence, ca well, maybe not coherence, maybe but we don't have capacity. Can we add C to it? Can we add capacity? <laughs> That's sure. what we don't have. And without add, capacity, add what you, like. you can't... Right, we'll, add in, we'll add in capacity. I'm going to move along. We've got... Car Carol has managed to get here. She apologises if she's had internet issues this morning. Carol, you poor thing. I bet you got super stressed about it all, but you're here now. I'm going to add you in. There you go. Listen, you, you've, you've missed the bulk of the conversation, but just to introduce you, Carol is a patient partner and advocate. She was originally supposed to be part of the panel. She's had internet issues this morning. Carol, help me understand or help, help our audience understand what would you like to see done to materially affect the quality of and effectiveness of patient communication? What I'd like to see done is um, people stop making excuses for the first thing. Um, there are a number of businesses um, in this country that have um, chat lines or, or, or numbers that you can ring if you've got a problem. I'm sure that the people that they employ to answer the phone there aren't degree standard and don't have all of the supposed attributes that um, have just been mentioned, but I've never yet come across anybody on any of those lines that's as rude as sometimes I find the receptionists. And I think the thing is that no, people have got to start remembering who they're doing the job for. Um, if you can, I mean, I, I so, so, sorry, sorry, Carol, because the danger is that this turns into and here's all that's wrong. What should we do about it? Is this fundamentally about training? Is it? Well, I was just going to get on to that and say that I think it is training. I think that um, the excuses are not good enough. I think training, um, A, right, let's put it like this. A, when you interview somebody, you can, ga you can gauge from the interview <laughs> whether or not they're a person that you immediately have empathy with. B, the training is necessary. The fact that um, if you're going to employ somebody to do a job, you have to train them. I mean, B, uh, British Airways are always quoted as being, I think it was the head of British Airways that said he wouldn't employ anybody without them being trained properly because the butt comes back and kicks him in the butt sort of thing. Um, I think that we have to start training people properly and we have to start paying them properly. And there's really no argument to say that we can do anything else. And the other thing is that we yeah, have just, to... Just use very quickly, please, Carol. Yes, we've only got um, 10 minutes left. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. There's some other people to ask questions. A final point from you. We have to use a language that everybody understands. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. David, you've got your hand up. Uh, would you like to make a, an observation or ask a question? Uh, it's more an observation, really. Um, I'm sort of coming at it from patients uh, who might have mental health illness autism, learning disabilities. And I think one of the things that happened for patients who are in uh, mental health wards, and the trust I was uh, with at the time, um, is how you communicate them when their relatives can't come in. They're often distressed anyway. And one of the things that uh, our, our trust did at the time was to buy a lot of digital equipment, which enabled those patients to communicate with members of their families. Um, because obviously somebody who's got mental illness then becomes confused as to why they can't do certain things. And it just showed that, that trust sometimes can react quickly to situations as it did in the pandemic and provided those um, uh, digital equipment, but and to relatives as well. Um, so it, I, I was looking at more at the optimistic side about, you know, looking at circumstances and how quickly trust can respond sometimes to improve the quality of their services to their patients. What, David, can I just ask, what have you made of the conversation that we had with the panellists at the beginning? Do you think we tackled the nub of the issues and provided some sensible solutions? Or is so I was, I was a bit late coming on, um, but one of the things, I mean, I was just listening, you know, about the um, discussion, you know, um, about expecting patients somehow to come, come to us. And I think it's absolutely right, you know, like Health Watch is saying, we need to go to patients where patients are. And it's not difficult as a governor. For example, I live in, in the black country. Um, and one of the things is fairly easy to do is to go to a mosque or a temple and say who you are 
And I remember an occasion when they said, well, we, could, could you come along to one of our meetings? There was 90 people there, four governors went, and we actually talked about the services being provided by the local hospital and got feedback. And that was an expectation that we would do so by the chief executive. So it's about being proactive and it's about going out there and listening to what people want and then being able to deliver what they want if it's possible. Well, again, I mean, you, the, the two points you've made there, first of all, you've endorsed Richard's point about this starts at the top. It starts about the leadership demanding that actually communications are taken seriously. And I think it's back to Owen's brilliantly made points throughout around means by which we go and engage with our local populations and, and find ways to do that in a multidisciplinary, multicultural manner. Um, yeah. So that actually yeah. it's, it, it's inclusive. Good. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else would like to ask a question quickly? We've got about eight minutes to go. John, I, maybe I, can I ask a question? Yeah, Richard, of course you can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Sorry, I, I was excluding you rather than. No, wor no worries at all. I think a lot of this discussion that's gone on, one perspective and only one, is the importance we place on treatment as a system versus communication. In other words, are we here to treat people? Are, are, are actually we here to help them get better? And that demands a different approach altogether. And if, if you say organizationally, our focus isn't just on clinical treatment, and I don't mean, I don't just mean the NHS, I mean the whole thing. If you ask that question, why are we here? You start to place different priorities on different issues and communication. If you say we're just here to treat, fine and dandy, that's that's what we're here for. That's the, and I think that's the assumed decision at the moment. And the organization seems set up to treat. But if we say no, we're here for a wider purpose, and maybe in 2022 we are now coming around to the realization that we are here for a wider purpose then where you put your energies and your training and your staff resources and your budgets start to shift and i don't know what other people might think about yeah well, I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna i'm gonna let claire come in then, yeah. then Owen, and then i'm gonna ask uh, carol if she'd like to as well so thank you yeah i mean excellent point and one of the things that i was going to say just as we sort of come towards the end then if we are daring to think you know, of this is the way forward. I think we've got to take it right the way back with regard to coherence. And if we are genuinely interested in the whole individual rather than treating and prevention rather than cure, surely what we should be thinking of is right from the onset, as in right from somebody, you know, when, you know, even pre-birth, why do we have so many varying agency involved at different points there's no continuity of that individual and having worked and I tell you something when you're working in services that you've got 16 to 18 year olds and then you have to transfer them into housing into the the amount of different individuals that are involved in different pieces to treat a different so whether it's treating a medical issue whether it's treating a complex mental health issue, whether it's treating a housing issue, at every point we've got different individuals coming in, which is why it makes coherence of communication so incredibly challenging. And which is why when we're looking at the poor GPs when their records, no wonder that they haven't got all of these records on because the challenge of moving from children's services to adult services and making sure that that information, because on you go and you get another raft of professionals and agencies involved, I think what we need to be doing, if we are genuinely, and what I'm hearing that the tone of the room today is everybody's really in favour of coherence, let's dare to dream and start saying about the need for coherence right from birth. And we have a shared information portal that goes right the way through that everybody is there and surely it's not beyond the wit of man. Now we can draw on and use utilise the digital and technology expertise that we have to yeah, I'm, Claire, I'm going to have to hurry you here, otherwise we're going to. No, you, I think everybody gets the point of what I'm saying. Thank you. So I will, Thank I will, I will move Owen, on. your thoughts on this very quickly, please. I, I really like Richard's thinking. I mean, there is something about the NHS, and I'll talk about the NHS. Communicates with patients when they've done something. So, so if you like, it's 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 the it's the invoice, it's your MOT certificate, it's your car service history. 
so we did this, we found this, we did this, and, and, and that's it. And I think with integrated care systems in England moving towards a much greater focus on prevention, you don't have that sort of relationship there because actually the people with the power are the residents. It's very much about using their assets. It's about thinking what strengths they have in their communities. So the, the communication there will have to change because it's about doing with rather than doing to. And, and that again, that, so that will demand a different way of engaging with people and talking to them and really understanding their context. And if we can have context as another C, because I think coming back to some of the comments that, that um, you know, Paul has been making about reception, receptionists, I mean, you put yourselves in their shoes and the abuse that receptionists have been having over the last two years or so, and in fact, primary care as a whole, we have to also think about context. And I'm not excusing rudeness, but actually we have to put it in context. I, I like that. We've now got five C's, by the way, from Richard's original three, but that's OK. You know, we, we can be flexible here. Um, it just means that the training programme that Richard will doubtless develop as a result of this will be now even longer and more expensive. But um, that's by the by. Carol, quickly from you. We've got two minutes to go. OK, so that's another C. Right. Um, I think communication, verbal communication is an art that's been lost. If you and, and I think the big problem here is that we've got lots of different people to deal with. Some people have got English as their first language. Some people haven't. But basically, when you boil it all down, if we actually speak to people rather than relying so heavily on digital, and if we learn to speak to people, and when I say learn to, I'm, I'm shocked at the number of times that I see young babies or young children in, in their push chairs with a, an I, the equivalent of an iPad, you know, with a, with a, a digital toy and the, the mums walking along together, chatting to each other and not to their children. So communication is, is being recognised in schools that it's, it's missing in kids. They're, they're really into doing everything digitally. So we have to teach people how to talk to each other and once well, you if, if I may, Carol, just to, sorry, we only have about 30 seconds to go, but there's the, you know, audio, visual and kinesthetic means of receiving information as well. So, you know, we do well to reflect upon that as well by means by which people receive information. Final point, Carol, very quickly. Final yeah. point uh, that I always try to impress, and that is patients are people. They're somebody's relatives. They're normal people that actually are worried. That's the only reason they come to us. And so we have to take that on board and remember it. Remember, patients are people. OK, thank you very much. We've got to finish it there. It's bang on nine o'clock. I'm a stickler for the timekeeping. That has been a brilliant, brilliant power hour. Huge thanks to Richard, to Claire, to Owen, and finally to Carol. She managed to get in here in the end for 15 minutes and we're very grateful to her. Thank you to all of you in the audience as well. I do hope you found that interesting. I might write up some notes. Heavens, I might even do a little editorial on this just to kind of bring everything together. But I've really enjoyed that. My thanks to all of you. Have a super weekend, folks. But for today, that is the Institute of Health and Social Care Management's Power Hour on Patient Communications. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.